Okay, we're recording. So Niels, whenever you're ready. Perfect. So yeah, I was going to um, talk about some of the ideas I had for uh, the kind of rotation, the project and, and what exactly uh, I might do. And um, can you all see the slides okay in my mouse? Yes. Okay, great. So um, the, the kind of main idea is essentially to build on what was done in the uh, using cortical grid cells to perform object recognition paper. Uh, and then try and replicate basically those results, but with actual images uh, and, and kind of show its, its flexibility in being able to do that. And so in order to kind of do this, then the, the basic idea is to say, okay, well, um, starting with images, simple images like MNIST or F, uh, fashion MNIST, um, how can we derive some meaningful SDRs to then feed into uh, the system of object recognition? And so to do this, I've just started with a uh, simple CNN architecture, convolutional neural network, which you know, kind of has this standard structure of convolutions followed by max pooling, um, where it's kind of 32 channels and 64 channels, um, and then uh, some uh, hidden layers uh, that are fully connected to perform classification. And then, um, so this, this kind of layer after the max pooling operation has been applied, ends up being five by five uh, in, uh, in kind of size. Uh, and then what I've kind of done is just um, use the K winner take all algorithm from um, that was kind of developed here at Numenta, but uh, with, with boosting and so on. Um, but the, the kind of local channel, channel wise K winner take all um, and then this ends up creating essentially um, kind of what's on the road to an SDR at each location. Uh, and then I just binarize them. So I should explain, so this K winner take all, this layer is in the network, in the CNN that's being trained uh, end to end to perform classification on MNIST or fashion MNIST. And I mean, I've shown these as integer values, but these are, yeah, just scalar values uh, that um, uh, yeah, will be kind of, uh, obviously the, the weights will be updated as it's trained. Then once I have kind of a fully trained network that performs reasonably um, at classifying MNIST or fashion MNIST, I show all the images and for each image, it's again going to output this five by five by 64 uh, kind of map, but then I'm binarizing these so that any of the winners are now a one rather than whatever um, kind of real valued number they had before. Uh, and so then the idea is, this is then the kind of features that can then be used in the, um, uh, for kind of grid cell object recognition, where uh, at each one of these 25 locations, there is an SDR. And then, so this, this was just kind of the idea to do this. Uh, obviously there's then an assumption that these SDRs are actually going to have some useful information about uh, the inputs after all this training has taken place. And so that's what I then um, am going to show on the next slide. But um, is that clear? Uh, yeah, so I, 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 but I have a question about it and it might be a stupid question, you know, because I don't, I'm not very fast with these. Uh, no, 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 no. Um, but you know, with the idea here ultimately is, you know, you have some, some features at some point in a reference frame, right? And um, but you haven't introduced that yet. All you have is, at the moment, all you have is its location on the image or something like that, um, which is not a proper location on the object, um, if, unless I'm com confused about something here. So, um, I mean, what am I missing there? How do, you, how do you get to this point where you're talking about reference frames and, and locations on reference frames? Yeah, so that's a good question. So, I mean, in MNIST and Fashion MNIST, the problem is kind of artificially solved because uh, they're both normalized images where yeah. uh, the, the image is very much in the center of, uh, or the object rather is very much in the center of the image. Yeah. Um, it's not like ImageNet or even CIFAR 10 where the location of the object in the image can change. Yeah. No, so given that, um, does it, uh, I'm just trying to understand like, well, what, I mean, that makes it easier for every solution to these problems, right? Um, 
Yeah. Um, so how does the, the whole reference frame idea, does this still play into this? Or, or you just haven't gotten to that yet? Or, or, or I think it will be clear, yeah, why, what I'm hoping to do with the reference frames that you wouldn't do with just a normal neural okay. network. All right, I'll let you keep going. Okay, but you did answer my first <laughs> yeah. question, which is essentially, yes. this, we're just assuming these things are normalized anyway, so that, we're going to go with that. Yeah. So what he's shown so far can be thought of as the, the equivalent of a spatial pooler. Uh, and and e this is showing what feature is at each point in the grid. Uh, so so it's like he's shown us the spatial pooler, but nothing else yet. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, but it, it, but it's a spatial pooler based on a location in the actual image that's presented as opposed to some image, uh, some location that's derived from a reference frame. So I think I got yeah. it. But to, okay. and, then, and then, yeah, in this case, those happen to line up, but yeah, yeah. Like okay. I say, okay. that, that wouldn't normally right. be the case. Got it. Um, and then, yeah, so then the question is, okay, well, I've kind of derived these features, but are they actually helpful? Um, so starting with MNIST, so uh, it's a 64 by five by five um, kind of vector of binary features. And then, so I can feed these into a linear classifier, uh, like a multi-layer um, perceptron um, and then a decoder. Um, so what I mean by this is kind of, if you have an autoencoder, uh, the kind of second half that will take these features and then try and reconstruct the um, the input is the the decoder. So the um, for context, the original K winner take all classifier, the one that's trained end to end uh, with these layers, achieves uh, sorry 99.2 percent accuracy. Um, if I feed these features, if I just take one of them, uh, I'm sorry, was that on, was that MNIST or was that the fashion MNIST? That was MNIST, yeah. Okay, okay. If I just take one of the SDRs, uh, this one, uh, and feed that to a linear classifier, then um, that gets kind of close to 60% uh, accuracy. Uh, so not very strong. But if I feed all of the SDRs uh, to a linear classifier, it actually does uh, quite close to um, the kind of original network. And, uh, but kind of shy of if I uh, feed them to a, a multi-layer perceptron. So um, I kind of try and I, I, I break down these results again uh, later on in kind of a table to show, um, to kind of summarize this. Uh, and then the decoder actually does uh, quite a good job reconstructing the inputs um, from the uh, original. So kind of in conclusion, there is um, definitely information in these features. It's not so trivial that just given one SDR you can kind of perform good classification. You do need access to uh, all of the features uh, in the input. And then there's some marginal gain from kind of a nonlinear transformation of uh, those features. Um, and then I, I did the same thing with fashion and this, and, and it's basically the same result, just slightly different. Um, but so kind of in summary, um, the kind of the way I'm interpreting this is the kind of the actual binarization process where I go from K winner take all to enforcing that the features are either zero or one causes this drop in um, classification accuracy from the original. And then in addition to this drop, if you then use a linear classifier instead of a multi-layer perceptron, uh, you get another uh, small drop. Um, but I mean, I, I haven't played around with this too much. Uh, I think changing the hyperparameters, for example, using a uh, larger uh, channel depth like 128 than you would normally with a, a CNN for MNIST and fashion MNIST uh, could result in uh, improvements and, and so forth. Um, but the kind of, what I kind of wanted to just check here was a sort of sanity check to make sure that, okay, using these features as an input to the grid cell uh, object recognition actually uh, makes sense. Um, so that's kind of, that's that side of things. Uh, and then, so in terms of kind of looking forward, so yeah, the main thing I wanted to start was looking at uh, was just object recognition. Uh, but this leads to kind of an interesting uh, situation where you kind of have sort of general versus particular digit recognition. So the usual task in MNIST is to kind of, yeah, classify nines as nines. Um, but uh, given the kind of uh, sort of objects that were used in the original publication, uh, you can imagine that uh, the 
architecture or the system would work well in classifying a particular nine uh, so that it's, you know, it's this uh, exact nine here and not the others. Um, and so what I'm going to kind of start with is, is just the, the kind of the simplest case where I'll have like kind of uh, possibly, um, yeah, 10 canonical examples and then performing classification on those. But when I move on to kind of wanting to classify nines in general or, or MNIST digits in general, um, yeah, I imagine it'll require some tweaking of the, the kind of hyperparameters of the, um, the grid cell algorithm to, to get it to uh, kind of robustly classify these. Uh, actually, and actually, yeah, I was meaning to, to look up what some of the kind of standard classification accuracies are on MNIST for uh, unsupervised classifiers because they, um, they are naturally lower than for uh, supervised ones. Um, but so, yeah, so that's one kind of, I think, potentially interesting challenge that I'll get to. And then the other thing is just this question of whether features are too distinctive. Um, because again, in the original paper, <clears throat> the features were artificial and so it was easy to control for whether they would kind of uh, instantly indicate what the object was, but here they're kind of uh, naturally derived. Um, and so there is that risk that they, I mean, given that a, a linear classifier can do this well, um, suggests that there is already quite a lot of information that essentially kind of a, a bag of features uh, classifier can, can make use of. Um, but then what might be interesting is then comparing how uh, it performs first as you kind of feed in progressively more of these features, how it compares to a linear classifier. Um, so yeah, so my next step is to kind of actually uh, look at implementing this object recognition. Uh, and then I thought I'd just discuss some of the ideas I have for kind of time permitting uh, what I could explore afterwards. Um, and so uh, kind of one of the things that's, uh, and so this kind of gets to your question earlier, Jeff, about like, why, why even kind of do this with um, the grid cell modules? So kind of one of the interesting properties of the original system is this kind of one few shot Hebbian memorization of feature location pairs. Um, and what I'm interested to see is if this is, which is kind of, yeah, very much part of the system in the original paper, but if this is still possible in the kind of same hyperparameter space that uh, enables robust uh, recognition of uh, digits. So kind of once, once I've found that uh, hyperparameter space where, okay, it can classify nines and ones and sevens, can it still uh, do this in one or a few shots or does it now actually require many more um, presentations? Um, uh, kind of, I think especially interesting thing would then be looking at kind of loop closure and zero shot inference, which uh, using the kind of decoder, what I could basically do is, uh, so for example, taking an image like this, feed in the features, the go through the kind of 25 uh, or the five by five grid in one order, and then go through it in a different order and ask the uh, system to predict what feature is there. But what uh, I think could then be interesting is because I'll be asking it to predict an SDR but I can then take those SDRs, including the one that's predicted, feed it into the decoder, and then actually see what the kind of completed image looks like. Mm. Um, and then compare that to if, if a random SDR is put in instead, um, just to get kind of a sense of, um, yeah. How, again, kind of how good is the system uh, a, when kind of dealing with real, um, real data? Um, and then this could also be compared to, for example, a recurrent neural network where it, um, the kind of uh, expectation is that although it'd be fine as long as you always feed the features in the same order, if you start feeding the features in a, a new order, uh, it will likely be stumped, um, whereas the system should be uh, robust to that. That seems like the sort of the first real, um, you know, test of the, the whole idea there, right? I mean, it's like, it's, it's, the, it's the position, yeah. not the, in the order that matters here. Um, exactly, yeah. I think yeah. up until this point, it's, yeah. Uh, the only reason I'm starting with the other things is because I think they will be easier things to begin with. But yeah, I yeah. think this is the more interesting. Um, yeah, okay. 
And then lastly, uh, this is kind of not something I've um, thought too hard about yet, but uh, bringing in some of these kind of hierarchical binding ideas from what I've been doing um, on my PhD, where kind of the features I've shown you so far are derived from this max pooling layer, but then the idea here is that there would be kind of multiple uh, levels of uh, abstraction. And then so, you know, possibly the, the max pooling ones are better for doing the object recognition part, but then the lower level ones would do a better job with the um, imagery construction. And then whether there's even a way of bringing in kind of displacement cells as a way of kind of mapping between these levels of uh, kind of feature abstraction. Um, but that's just kind of, yeah. Uh, if, if I've got time, something that I think could be interesting to start looking to. And so, that's, um, that's, yeah, that's a summary of everything. So yeah, it, it's interesting. I'm just trying to understand um, this in, in context of the way I think about things. What, you know, yeah. one of the things when we, when, if you were presented with an MNIST character that's not obvious to you, and there's, there's a bunch that are kind of like, yeah, what's that? Right? <laughs> And, uh, and uh, so what we tend to do, and we tend to do with any object we don't recognize, is we attend to different components of it, small parts, and we scan them, mm -hmm. you know, and, and by looking at the, look at the relationships of subcomponents, it can remind us of something we know. So I don't understand mm -hmm. what this led, but, but I see, oh, that looks relative to this, well, like it might like be a seven, or this relative to something else might be a three or something like that. And so that, we kind of go through this uh, serial uh, attentional process when we see something we it's unfamiliar to us whether it doesn't have to be you know it could be any time I'm presented with something new that's what we do we talked about this quite a bit um, and so um, it, it doesn't seem you're capturing that aspect of this and I'm not I don't mean you should I'm just just making sure I understand this it's like it, it's there it would be like the way we would learn a new letter um, if I was teaching a child a, a new character, I would I would point out the different components and I'd say, oh, well, it goes across and there's a down thing and there's another thing and there's a round thing. And so we, we sort of teach it as these subcomponents surely presented. Um, and then only after you've trained it that way can you then say, oh, I recognize it. Um, in the same way, like we might train a word, you can say, oh, it's this three letter, this letter, this letter, this letter. And you learn them in order, but after you've learned it, then you can just look at the whole word. Um, and so I, I think that it's, it's interesting. I don't think you're really capturing that in part of this here. So, yeah, I guess, yeah, I, the way I kind of see it is that what I'm kind of doing is, yeah, capturing the features in parallel all at once, kind of. Yeah. Um, but then the, the processing of those features is following more a process like what you're describing. Oh, kind okay. Of so, I, to. Yeah, okay. So I guess I wasn't really clear about that. So you're, it, I, obviously, you can process the features all at once. It doesn't really matter. They're just sitting there in a buffer someplace. <laughs> so the question is, when you train, how do you go about it? And um, yeah. Um, so you think you're capturing that then? Uh, I would say, yeah, in, in the sense that, um, yeah, because when I'm, if, if, if I ignore the kind of the way these features were extracted in the first place, the, the way that the, it's kind of doing object recognition is like in the, um, Okay. Again, in, yeah. in, in the original paper, where it's kind of it's yeah. going to attend to the different the twenty five different locations serially. It's not going to do them. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's um, so it would, it be, would almost be like it would almost be like uh, being presented a, an object, an, a novel object that you've never really seen before. So you you just get a, a you know, one hundred and fifty milliseconds to look at it or whatever. Yeah. And then it's gone. But then in your head you're able to kind of parse through so, so what that you've just one, seen. When you talk about like this one shot learning or something like that, it's not, is it really one shot or is it a series of attentional points and that's one shot? I mean, it, Oh yeah, sorry. I mean, yeah, one shot in terms of, um, yeah, learning the associations between okay, a okay, okay. feature and a location. Yeah, sorry, not, not in terms of um, I mean, because you know, we don't think the brain ever does anything. You know, we have this idea, oh, is it, we can do this one shot learning, we're so quick. Well, we don't really, right? We're, we're really quick, but we, we do it surely. So I think capturing that is important. I think another interesting thing you might just think about, uh, and perhaps you already have, is, you know, what happens if you present a, a, a character which is really ambiguous, you know, and outside of eminence? I don't know, give it something completely, you know, then, you, you know, you, you give it a half and half, you know, in, in theory, the order in which you go through it in, in a, a brain would say, hey, I've attended to these three features, it looks like X, and I've attended to these three features, it looks like Y. 
um, because it doesn't look, you know, the thing is new and obvious. And then you could say, hey, it's a bit like X and it's a bit like Y. And that would be very clear. Uh, it, it seems like there's, some, there's something there too that you might think about exploring. Um, mm. uh, yeah, it, how it generalizes to. Yeah, it's, in some sense, it's a generalization mechanism, right? Yeah, you're, you're, you're finding that subsets of the thing you're looking at are like this and subsets are like that. And so you can go back and forth saying like, yeah, I can see why it's like X and I can see why it's like Y. It's not just, bam, here's an image, I'm confused, or it's, you know, it'd be more like, hey, when I look at it this way, it's clearly X, when I look at it this way, it's clearly, you know, Y. And so right. there's, there's two interpretations as opposed to just a muddied interpretation. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, th there might be something there, I don't know. Yeah, that could be interesting to um, think about in terms of the, again, it is kind of the second point, because I think there's a lot of things I could do looking at kind of what sort of predictions it's making uh, yeah. in, yeah. I mean, uh, but, but, but that does get, I'll it, it seems like, that. yeah, it, it does get, to, I think ultimately that's going to be one of the key ways that the, we know that the brain generalizes it, or, or, or it, yeah, it, it sees something new and experiences something new and says, what's this like? And of course, you know, we also, or it ultimately will associate movements or behaviors associated with those collections of features or so on. And so then you'd say, oh, if I see this novel object, I now know how to manipulate it because over here, there's a button that looks like an on-off switch, but maybe over here, there's a button that looks like it, you know, or there's another feature that looks like it's, you push on and it does something else. So, um, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's I'm, what I'm saying is that generalization is not just recognizing something. Generalization is how you might use the thing. Um, so right. if, I see, if I see a new tool, I'll say, what is an app or a tool in the shop or something like that, I'll say, oh, well, I can guess how this thing might work. So anyway, just moving that direction it seems like a, uh, or thinking about moving that direction seems like a, um, yeah. a fruitful, a fruitful, yeah, no, I'll have long, to think about that. the long term research, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, field. You could, you could go on that for years. <laughs> okay, right, I'll say enough. Thanks. So, uh, and then uh, earlier slide with the, uh, when you showed the 25 SDRs versus the one SDR, um, what were those? SDRs. I still wasn't clear on that. Are those were the each of those from yeah. a feature map, or what were the, or was so, that so a location was, on the image? Yeah, by feature map you mean the the kind of channel. Um, yeah. Yeah. So there so there's sixty four feature maps. So each SDR is kind of taking one location and going, taking all of the activations at the location across the feature maps. Okay, so um, it was just basically it, just in, with in a sense one that, pixel of the image or one sub portion of the image. It was the exactly, SDR like for one, that sub portion. Exactly, and then yeah. So so when I did the one SDR, I assumed the middle one would probably be the, the most one. useful. That answers my question. Okay, cool. That was gonna. Yeah, it'd be no, I, did, I didn't to use take the, like the first pixel, the first corner, right, and, right, right. <laughs> and think it should be identified from that. I see. So yeah. so in case of like, um, am I correct to understand like? Um, there's there's really not not really much spatial information in um, in each of these SDRs. The the SDR is like um, this is quite analogous to um, to the paper you're talking about. We call it columns plus locations in the neocortex, right. where like um, where this is really saying like at this location on the image, um, what is the feature SDR? Uh, there's no location information there. It's just like you're not encoding where on the image this is. That that same SDR could occur anywhere. It, it's it's very much analogous to the spatial pooler. It's what yeah, is you the mean feature when, when I just feed image. one. Oh well, any of yes, yeah. Um, but like you said, the twenty five is like a bag of features, though. It's like a bag yeah, of yeah. It, um, it doesn't yeah. It's yeah. like yeah, a, it like, also doesn't have it, it has, it has I no guess, relative. I guess what's interesting. Go on. I guess what yeah was just interesting was just how well this did despite not having that kind of spatial um well, yeah. given that it's convolutional there is spatial semantics mm. in how, how it's laid out so uh, i don't think you, you can just, it's basically the the spatial location is implicit by where it is in that array even if it's you know if you yeah. look back out to it it's you know maybe looking at you know a, a 25 by 25 region or you know whatever whatever the you know because you're going back a couple of levels of convolution so there is spatial information That's true. There. I, would, I would have to uh almost like randomize the uh, yeah. locations of the SDRs. But yeah, no, then again, if, uh, if, you, if you randomize it, then, I mean, then you are having a bag of features that have no relationships among each other. With the way it is right now, you do have relative relationships 
in yeah. to whatever extent things are being aggregated through the linear classifier that, you know, the upper That's left patent corner plus something else like that, that combination, if I weight that, then it says, okay, that's, that's a dominant feature indicative of something, you know? So yeah. I, I, I think you've got both. Yeah. I think, I think you're right. I'm going to uh, look at that. Yeah. Just one of my main points is you really can look at this as, um, as like almost taking one way to look at what Niels is doing is, is taking the, um, columns plus the locations in the neocortex model and applying it to actual data rather than these manufactured features that we were using. Yeah. And, he, and, and in a sense, you do it for uh, part, part of how he's going about it is replacing the spatial pooler with like a small convolutional neural network. Hmm. And, and then finding a way to get SDRs out of that using K winners and binarizing it. Yeah. Great. Well, yeah. Um, All right. I don't know if there's any other comments or. No, that was helpful to me. Great. All right. And then, yeah, I can uh, obviously present again uh, once I've made some progress. <laughs> See what happens. Okay. All right. Do we have any other topics for today? Was that it? All right. I think we're done then. All right. Thank you, Mills. Uh, yeah. Thank you.